Um, I think the title of this is something about zero carbon, you know, how, how we are going to achieve zero carbon or the route to zero carbon, um, which is something that we are grappling with and have kind of declared that we are aiming for. Um, and I think the more we kind of look into it, the more complicated it is. So uh, we cannot give you a route to zero carbon. I think, I think what we want to show is, um, you know, what we've done, what we've learned from what we've done. And one of the, I think the most important things is actually to learn from things you did well and, and mistakes and work out how you can do things better. Um, I think there's a kind of fundamental issue with environmental design, which is a perception of aesthetics, um, which I have to say has put us off in the past. Um, and I think what, you know, I think I've just tried to look at projects and analyze what makes them potentially environmental. And um, so I'm looking at some projects we did and trying to work out, you know, trying to look at why they're environmental, um, even though they're not zero carbon. And I think we've got John Palmer from Passive House Trust. He's going to give us lots of facts and figures about um, how to achieve the zero carbon targets and the importance of, of fabric design in that, in that process. Um, and then Dave is going to take over and talk about um, some of the projects we've got on the drawing board and how what we've learned is affecting how we approach the design of them. Um, so one of, you know, just kind of, I'm just going to talk about three projects, but I wanted to talk about Park Hill because it's not, it's obviously not a zero carbon building. It's an exposed concrete frame building. Um, but a lot of the ideas embedded in it are the, lot, lot of the ones that we're grappling with as architects trying to design great housing. But it doesn't look like a, an environmental scheme. It doesn't look like a solar scheme, but actually that's what it is. Um, so we're doing phase uh, two, which is the red block, um, which is, which is uh, 200 homes. It was 1,000 homes built. Um, and actually, I, I thought I knew this building because I was a student at Sheffield and it was quite an important building for us in Sheffield. Um, but having had the privilege of kind of studying it in more detail and trying to work out why it was done like that, it's been quite an interesting process. Um, and actually, this is fundamentally a solar scheme. Um, and also, so that there's not, there, there's lots of documentation and information about this project, but not much about the design process. So you look at it and you think, what, you know, why is it like that? What, what were they thinking? Um, and actually, I think this is a good view because it starts to show that as the scale increases, I mean, it's got a completely flat roof. So the hill, you can see the, the hill by the number of stories in the buildings. And as the scale increases, the size of the courtyards increase as it goes down the hill um, and so you know there's lots of ideas about overshadowing and solar gain just looking at just in this particular image um, and then when you look at more closely at the plan and you can see the north the north sign when you look at the design of it it is fun it's it's not very rigorous in many ways so the lengths of the flanks are all different and it, you know it's really hard to understand why certain decisions were made but it's fundamentally solar so whenever a flank moves from the north to the south the street changes so that all the habitable rooms are facing south um, and um, you know this is our bit we haven't done anything to it yet um, against phase one so phase one you can see the the solar side which has got the 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 balconies and you know inbuilt solar shading effectively and then the north side which is the bit which we haven't touched yet which are all the bedroom windows so there's so this is this is a yeah it's it's quite fascinating to look at how it's designed um we've got three streets now this is a section um you know i think everyone knows that the streets were given the names of the streets that were there during the slum clearance and lifted into the sky um and 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 there i I don't know whether it's apocryphal, but there was an idea that people, neighbours were kept together and st whole streets of people were lifted up to live together. So there's a kind of community ideas, but really the generation of those ideas was, was about safe streets, car-free streets, which is another kind of fundamental thing that we grapple with um, when we're doing housing design. And you can see that the two sides are very different, the north facing side to the south facing side, which is balconies and and uh, sorry, <laughs> I knew this wasn't going to go very smoothly. Um, so uh, just 
moving on. And obviously the streets had a very kind of social side. They were designed around the idea that the most important thing was to get your milk delivered. Um, but they also, you know, served as car free play spaces. So I think, um, oh, Parker Morris standards, you know, great space standards, um, dual aspect flats. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do at the moment um, for, for slightly different reasons, but still, they're still there. And, um, and you know, these are, these are the um, pegs for hanging washing. Everything's been thought about in this building. We found um, underfloor heating pipes, really early ones. There was district heating. And so there was some ambition there, which was, kind of, I think, lost slightly with the, with, with the reaction against this type of, you know, it, it's perceived failure. Um, and the ideas are really quite current. And it kind of, we, we are, we're, I'm not gonna really talk about what we're doing. We're kind of introducing insulation where we can, there's very low floor to ceiling height. So there's a limited amount we can do. We're doing the best we can with this building and, and improving it beyond current building regulations. But fundamentally, I think retaining, the, the, we know about the embodied carbon in concrete and just, keeping it is, is um, I think, a really important um, thing to consider when you're looking at zero carbon. Um, that's it. That wasn't long ago. Um, and I, yeah, I'm always kind of struck by how easy this, it would be to make this building into a passive house building. Obviously, there's fundamental problems with the massive kind of cold bridge that the street makes, but it really is a solar scheme and designed on solar principles with shading and all of the things that that I think are the basic building blocks of trying to aim for, for zero carbon. Um, we first became interested in it um, with a project we, as Richie's Hawley Mikhail with our partner Kathy Hawley, we did a project called Clayfield in Suffolk. Um, and that was for Orwell Housing Association. And um, it was actually a, a competition started by the Suffolk Preservation Society with a really deep green agenda. And it was the first time we'd really, this was 2005, so it's, I think, quite, you know, quite a different brief to the one you would normally have at that time. But it asked for a, a scheme that was very low carbon in construction and use. Um, and we didn't really know much about it. And we teamed up with Bureau Hackold, who did, who did know what to do. Um, and they said, well, look, don't forget about all those bolt-on technologies, solar panels, uh, wind turbines, they're all changing. You know, they're, they're maintenance, it's a housing association, it's all social housing just do a fabric first passive house scheme, a passive solar scheme. And so, you know, basically try and orientate the building south and don't, don't overshadow each other, you know, position them so they don't overshadow each other in winter. Um, and the site was, it, you know, it was, it was a, in a little village with a train station. So it was, you know, potentially quite a good place to do a, an environmental scheme um, or walkable. Um, and, but when we looked at the site, it was actually very difficult to face all the buildings south, south and um, stop them overshadowing each other and get the density on there, which was 49 dwellings per hectare. Um, that's, so we spent most of the time trying to do, you know, solve this one particular problem. And we came up with this scheme, which is a series of staggered um, um, terraces of three houses. So there was a kind of idea and plan about um, about you know how you could organize buildings so they didn't overshadow each other and um, this was about the hundredth iteration we looked at and um and also an idea in section about um you know modulating the sections so that winter sun could get into all the windows in the building um and and we did our very first sketch up model um to test this and in winter you can see that the tallest buildings um, cast shadows over the open spaces that we've left, which were um, a combination of a wildflower meadow and children's play area. There was a football pitch and allotments. And, and um, that's what it looks like. So it really, it really is a description of the problem we were trying to address, which was a very singular problem about how to make a passive solar scheme on this site at this density. Um, and, and we there was ideas about low carbon construction as well in the brief, which was very unusual at that time. We tried to find ways to get over concrete foundations and couldn't. We looked at ram chalk and things that just wasn't going to be feasible with building regulations. So there is some concrete, but the but it's it's everything above it is timber. Um, and the it was prefabricated timber panels with a kind of sags mox board on the one side, which provided racking, but also is is predominantly wood wood fibre. 
um, and then into it was blown in, um, lime hemp, which was the first time it had been done at this scale in this country. It was a wet process, kind of similar to uh, spraying concrete. And it was a very, very difficult thing on site. Um, the drying time wasn't as we'd expected. Uh, and, and actually, we love this material, but we were really put off by the problems it caused with, with drying out and, and the effect on program it had when we were building it. And I'm delighted that it's now um, available as prefabricated panels, because I think that suddenly makes this, this type of um, building material um, usable really for at a scale of this of this type. Um, so why lime hemp? Well, we we were working like um, Ralph Carpenter was an architect working in Suffolk, and he'd he'd been convinced about the properties of lime hemp as a very low carbon building material. It's it was growing locally in Essex, um, and he persuaded a housing association to build two semi detached houses one of which was brick and block and one of which was lime hemp. And they were both built to the same U value as each other. Um, and what he, what he found in subsequently was that, that hempcrete outperformed the brick and block significantly. And it wasn't just in terms of heat loss, the heat, the heat loss through the fabric being much better than anticipated, but also the thermal comfort meant that people weren't putting radiators up as high. Um, and it was a much felt like a much healthier environment for people to be in. So we were convinced with this, and actually, we we did a scheme which, um, if you know U values, you'll know that um, these aren't great U values to aim for in a in a in, in a really kind of eco scheme. They're quite low U values, but we were kind of convinced by this that that actually it might outperform its U value. Um, and but the thing that really convinced us was its carbon, its CO two in construction. So these, I'm sure these calculations will change now. We've got some more sophisticated ways of looking at building materials. These were done at the time, but it, it seemed like there was a significant carbon saving in using lime hemp as, as a construction material. Um, and then other things, low carbon, um, we use mud, uh, unfired mud um, bricks to make the walls and they were lime rendered um, with these little kind of roofs on them to stop them kind of idea from Japan um, and so that that project was really kind of more for us an investigation in low carbon in construction rather than use although we were kind of following Bureau Hapold's advice but what what kind of changed it for us really in thinking about this way of designing was the fact that they did a really extensive post occupancy analysis on the scheme um, and obviously they predicted outcomes so they had a predicted you know, electricity, water use, and 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 heat heat use, um, and they were greatly disappointed by the results in terms of electricity and water. But actually, the heat loss through the fabric was significantly great less than they were anticipating, and it outperformed their expectation significantly. I think almost it almost double or half, which way you look at it. So, I mean, our big takeaway was well, maybe this you know solar therm this solar scheme idea works and maybe the lime hemp performs better than predicted and it they went on to i mean this is i think there were 11 schemes that had had this type of post occupancy analysis at this time you can see at the far end there's a passive house scheme we kind of fell into the middle um and they looked at then they then they studied um each house and the and the use of electricity heat and water um to see how individuals behavior was affecting the performance of the building and there was some there were some really significant findings so if you look at one side number three and at the other side number seven were exactly the same house they were an end of terrace three bedroom house um occupied by a similar size family um so they interviewed them extensively to try and find out why there was this massive dif difference in how they were using the house and energy consumption and there were lots of takeaways from that it's been quite a lot published about it but the one i really like is the thermostat setting you know what you it's it's an exponential relationship to what temperature you set your thermostat at to how much energy you use in the, in space heating um which I, I found fascinating so we should all be setting our thermostats at very low um but i think um we we had some thermal imaging done of it and and we found similar to the hemp um house that 
it performed very well, much better than expected. The brick plinth is a real problem. There we'd used um, an insulation, you know, a, a, below, a below DPC insulation, a rigid um, petrochemical type insulation to the same U value as the lime hemp and it's massively leaked energy. And I think this is really kind of highlights that U values aren't a great way of assessing building performance if they're, if they're building um, materials which have a kind of thermodynamic property to them. So um, hemp, hemp, lime hemp absorbs moisture and releases it. And I, yeah, that's probably why it has a different property or that's a bit technical. Um, yeah, so back onto that. So I think what we took away from this, and it was a great privilege to, to be, have this data on the building that we designed, which is really an unusual thing. And, and it kind of convinced us that, that um, you know, we need to be thinking about doing passive solar schemes elsewhere, particularly where there's, you know, with social housing, where there's real problems with fuel poverty. And it seemed like a real kind of win-win situation. If we could just do a passive solar scheme, solar scheme then we could massively save on people's fuel bills um so when norwich came along we were like okay let's try it on this site and again this was um this was a project which we won on competition as richie swirly mikhail um it went away for a long time <laughs> and then came back um but here we had um this was the it was an rba competition and the brief wasn't like really green but there was certainly you know an idea about making somewhere, you know, reducing car dependency, making places where residents feel safe, walkable neighborhoods and things like that. And so we really tried our best to, we thought we're gonna go in and do a passive solar scheme on this site. It was a higher density, this is 90 dwellings per hectare as opposed to 49. So, so we wanted to see if we could make it work. Um, and the site is in Norwich, it's very near the city center. You can see the castle. Um, highlighted but it was very near the old um, Lake Victorian streets which were called the Golden Triangle, a very popular place to live in Norwich um, and 14 meters apart and you know the, this this distance which is a really typical understandable distance for any kind of Victorian neighborhood is obviously not allowed with um, current overlooking distances um, which are all 21 outside London, um, and it's really hard to get around them. Um, but if we applied this 14 meter distance to the site, it completely unlocked it and it turned it into a streets of houses rather than what would have been flats. Um, and so we applied the same sectional ideas to that project. Could we get winter sun at that density into all the south facing glazing? Um, you know, learning from Clayfield, we probably need to do a bit of shading as well because we hadn't we hadn't shaded it and, and there was some overheating issues. So um, so we came up with this kind of cross section through this the site with 14 meter streets and 14 meter wide gardens. We still had to um, satisfy the overlooking distances of 21 meters. So the way we got around that is to say, right, we're gonna face all the habitable rooms the same way. So all 75% of habitable rooms face south. The only ones that don't are north facing ground floor living rooms, which we could deal with privacy in a in a you know an individual different way. Um, and it fitted, it just fitted really perfectly on the site. <laughs> we were lucky. Um, and so yeah, the scheme worked with Pesto scheme and um yeah, we had landscape ideas as well about, you know, connected landscapes of different scales for different age groups and pedestrian links and, you know, connections to the high street to buses and cycling and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, and, and then the, the, the project died a death during the credit crunch um, and we kind of didn't expect to um, build it at all. And then suddenly we got a phone call from Norwich who actually hadn't sold it to the housing provider they were working with, they'd, they kept it saying, do, do we want to do it, but could it be passive house instead of passive solar? And I think we, we both thought, oh no, <laughs> um, <laughs> because I think we had preconceptions about passive house being, you know, not, no glazing to the north, which is a real problem when half the street faces north and you know, we, yeah, we just had preconceptions about its aesthetics that I think made us, we obviously said we were going to try it, but um, we weren't entirely delighted by that change. Um, but actually, because it was a 
passive solar scheme, it, it did mean that we already had some inbuilt advantages to achieving passive house. So it meant, you know, we could have windows to the north. Um, and, you know, fundamentally it meant the walls got thicker, we had more insulation, air tightness is obviously a you know, really big issue. Um, and we had to make some changes, which at the time were really difficult. We, you know, we had ideas about sliding folding doors onto the garden and things which we had to fundamentally design out because every, every threshold detail is a form of cold bridge. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, those are the south facing windows. We obviously had to introduce, you know, the solar shading and obviously that, that gets the most sun. So you can see there are two bedroom windows and a kitchen, living, dining room on the ground floor. Um, and the occasional pop-up roof for a third or fourth bedroom. Um, and then, and, oh yeah, so this is um, a section, our walls are over 600 mil thick. Um, there, we, we introduced these details, which again are about passive house, they're coffering reveals because the, the, the walls got so deep to try and introduce more daylight and also provide movement joint between brickwork and timber frame. Um, but we have fundamentally six, 600 mil buildup of mostly insulation, which is a cellulose insulation, um, which was uh, uh, chosen for its um, low carbon footprint. That's the north facade. We, we have glazing, which is a relief. Um, the windows are obviously smaller. The, the, height of the, the height of the facade is lower because we're trying to get sunlight to the other side of the, of the um, road on the 14 meter gradient. And, and you have to think about details if you're, if you're you know, really trying to design out cold bridges, you have to use the cold external skin of the building to provide things like, you know, um, door entrance, entrances, you can't, it, they are basically the closer to a box as possible, the better. So we, you know, trying to introduce some details by just changing the external skin of the, the building was, was, you know, as, as good as we could get. A lot of what we were hoping would be doors out to gardens have actually become these windows with with these sills um, as well. So it wasn't um, completely pain free. <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, as well as as well as the kind of pacifiers ideas, there are ideas about a kind of environmental sustainability, which is about landscape, about communities growing, about you know reducing car dependency prioritizing pedestrians and there are these different scales of landscape space for different ages of children and um, probably the one that was the hardest to get through were these um these alleyways at the back of houses for children to play and i think that the their success they, they were the most worrying parts of the scheme where you just were, what, what if they don't work but actually they've been incredibly successful i don't know how they're coping with it now but i guess there's um space to get, be two meters apart from each other um, and then these let, lead on to different scale spaces um, with children's play. And so, I mean, this is, this is lo looking at the street at the flats, which all have their own front doors. Um, and I think, oh, you can see the thing that a lot of people have um, quite fixated on is the fact that, that you, there's no letter boxes because they're passive house, so the letter boxes are outside. But I think fundamentally, having been through this journey of being not resistant but slightly concerned about passive house as a protocol and the effect it might have on the design of the building I think we've gone from being very skeptical to actually believing that we should be considering this environmental standard and not talking about certification but certainly building buildings to this this environmental um, standard if we're going to hit any of the zero carbon targets that we hope and so I'm hoping that um, John can take over and put a some facts and figures to this. Okay, great. Oh. Um, thank you very much. Do I unshare? How do I do it? Stop I sharing. I, can, I think I can just carry on and share. Right. Can everybody see my screen? That's great. Okay, just going to refind my window so I think you all disappeared. There we go. Uh, right, so hi everybody, um, John Palmer from the Passive House Trust. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Passive House, but um, I'm actually going to talk in the main about um, Net Zero. Um, and I would like to be a little bit controversial, and I would also like to um, 
scare you a little bit um, and um, uh, leave you with the impression that passive house isn't just a good thing to do, it's perhaps the only thing we should be doing. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see how you, uh, how you, what conclusion you come to. So I've got 10 minutes, I normally do this, this whole thing in um, about four hour long tutorials, so I'm going to fit it into hopefully 10 minutes. Uh, we're going to go over options for um, getting to net zero, why we shouldn't be aiming for net, oops, why we shouldn't be aiming for um, net zero buildings to get to net zero. Um, now that might sound counterintuitive, but I'll explain when I, when I get there. Um, the scale of the challenge, just to, to see you know, what we need to do as a nation um, and how we might do this at the end. So first of all, I just wanted to, um, I'm sure you'll all be familiar with embodied versus operational, um, but I just wanted to sort of highlight that I'm going to be talking about operational um, emissions and operational energy, which is what Passive House focuses on, not on embodied. That's not because embodied isn't important. Um, as Annalie said, um, the materials that go into the build are crucial in, in, in terms of its overall embodied carbon, but um, operational is also the other side of the coin, and in, in may, many cases they complement each other. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about bodies today, but in bodies is, is extremely important. And as you can see, uh, operational happens during the lifetime of the building. So if you, if you build an inefficient building at the start, then you've got 60 years plus of inefficiency built in. So options for getting to net zero. So we've, uh, we've got a couple of options here. We can um, use, I'll just use my uh, uh, pointer, see if I can, uh, no, I haven't got it. Um, so what we can do is we can uh, sort of carry on where, where we are. And um, so say we've got a building, a standard property here, and we can use lots of energy during its lifetime. Um, or we can uh, do something like passive house, a fabric first approach, doesn't have to be passive house necessarily. And we can take away a lot of that energy to start with. Um, and then during the lifetime, we only use a small amount. Okay, two alternative approaches. Um, now for option one, that means that to get to net zero, we need to generate this big columns worth here of energy. Uh, whereas for option two, we only need to generate that much. Okay. So that's the first, that's, that's the basic choice we've got. We've got carry on building as we are um, or build more efficiently, both of which we can get to net zero. Yeah, as long as we generate enough, both can be net zero. So why might we want to do one rather than the other? Well, the first thing is that the cheapest energy is the energy you don't use. So all that energy that we have to generate comes from somewhere. It comes from offshore wind, it might be heat pumps, it might be PV. Um, and those have a cost associated with them um, because they have to be replaced every 22 and for 25 years. If you build into the fabric of the building, then you build that once and that efficiency lasts for the lifetime. So from a cost basis, it makes sense to build with an improved fabric. But why don't we just do this? Why don't we wait for the grid to decarbonize? We know that um, the grid is coming down. Does everybody know how far the grid has decarbonized? Uh, if people are allowed to speak on these these things or put in chat or whatever. But um, does everybody want to shout? Any idea how far the grid has decarbonized? No volunteers. So um, the last version of SAP, which is just about to go out, had a uh, carbon intensity of 539. Um, so that's before this chart predates 2017. And it's going to come down to, in 2020, roughly um, about 140, 130, 140. So we've done really well. The UK is a world leader um, in um, our offshore um, energy and renewable energy in, in, in general. So why don't we just do this? Why don't we carry on building what we're building and wait for the grid to come down to almost zero by 2050? Um, and that does the work for us. OK, well, there's a slight problem with that. Everybody recognize one of these? That's uh, a gas boiler, typical gas boiler. And most of the homes in the UK, um, 80 to 90%, have got that as their primary heating and hot water source. Does that plug into the grid? No, it plugs into the gas grid, but not the electricity grid. Where is our renewable energy? Our renewable energy is in the electricity grid. So gas will continue burning the same amount of CO2 from now to 2050 and beyond, and that will not decarbonize. I can talk about green gas, et cetera, later options, but in general, the fossil fuel is gonna be a fossil fuel. First rule of net zero, stop burning stuff. 
in particular, stop burning stuff that comes out of the ground. So we can't really do that. So what we've got to do is move our, um, uh, our heating and our hot water for our homes um, over to an electrical sourced um, uh, heat source. And this is an example of an air source heat pump. There are other options, um, but we need to, to move that across. So that's fine. Let's just do that. Let's also not do anything to our buildings. Let's take out all our gas boilers and let's put in our air source heat pumps. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is that our grid has only got a certain amount of capacity. So if we put a 15 kilowatt air source heat pump, arguably that's not big enough for our um, many of our uh, um, older homes, but let's just say for argument's sake, if we put a 15 um, kilowatt air source heat pump into every home in the UK, we'd add 125 gigawatts of load to the grid. Let's say we made all those homes energy efficient and we managed to get that down to a much smaller heat pump, um, five kilowatts, then it would be 42 gigawatts. Is that a lot? Is that good? Is that achievable? Well, the current grid capacity, and that's not just domestic buildings, that's absolutely everything um, that runs on electricity, so transport, um, commerce, um, industry, the current grid capacity is 100 gigawatts. So what we're saying there is right now, the capacity would be completely swamped by just heating the homes if we just move them all across. And even if we did and um, made them more energy efficient, it's, it's about half. In 2050, we're gonna be up to about 260 gigawatts. Um, but just remember, all that renewable energy, people need to access. So all the transport sector, all the industry sector, all the retail sector, everybody's gonna be wanting to use that as a resource. So we can't really, even with our, our sort of lower, lower end of the scale, we can't afford to give that much energy. There won't be that much energy available um, for power actually, power available for um, our domestic building. So it's, it's just not, not gonna work, the capacity is not there. So my next point is why we shouldn't be aiming for net zero buildings to get to net zero. Um, so let me explain what I mean. What we've got here is um, a couple of different um, buildings and you can see the, the demand is built up of their heating, hot water, lighting, the usual sort of thing that you'd imagine. Um, for a building rates building with an air source heat pump in 2020, it's just under 8,000 kilowatt hours per year. And a passive house is about, about half, about half that. So um, what we would need to do to get this building to be, to get our passive house to net zero is to generate just under 4,000 kilowatt hours. So that's net zero. You, you use that much, you generate the same, that's net zero. This is for a 68 meter squared house or dwelling which is, um, as of, I think, a couple of years ago, the average new build size in the UK. So is that, is that a big building? Not really. And how many solar panels do you think it's gonna get, it's gonna require to generate 4,000 kilowatt hours? 14 solar panels, okay. So 14 solar panels on a 68 meter squared, what's that, apartment? Maybe a maisonette, if, if you're lucky. What does that look like? Well. We start off here with our 14 solar panels. We put that on a single story building with hopefully a south facing roof, maybe possible, but not in all cases, and they fit. If we make it into a maisonette, two story, they don't quite fit. If we make it into a three story, then they definitely don't fit. So the sort of building form that we're gonna be wanting to build with these um, uh, buildings just doesn't necessarily work. And what that means, is that we're building not very efficiently. So if you, um, uh, people may be familiar with form factor, this is a key part of the passive house standard, um, which is you build efficiently to start with and that makes everything else easier. So we've got two dwellings here. One uh, is a, um, a single story, um, 93 meters squared of um, floor area um, and 280 meters squared of heat loss area. So that's um, walls, roofs, floors that are in contact with the outside world. Um, and the other dwelling is 93 meters squared, so exactly the same livable floor area, but a quarter of the heat loss area. So to get both of these to passive house is certainly possible, but you're gonna be putting a huge amount of extra insulation, better quality glazing, more work into thermal bridges into the top one and the bottom one to get it to the same level of efficiency. So your top building is a less efficient shape before you even started to do anything with the fabric specification. So if I just go back to that drawing, what are we trying to do here? 
to get to a, the only feasible building, which is net zero on site, is actually to build a bungalow in this case. And that has to be a passive house bungalow. And as I've just told you, that's gonna be expensive and difficult to do. This building, far cheaper to construct, but it's not net zero, which is the better option. Well, so what I'm saying is that trying to make every single building net zero is actually a false hope. It's a false dawn. It's gonna lead us down building vast areas of inefficient bungalow type buildings to get that amount of generation on the site. What we actually should be doing is drawing the system boundary around the entire country and saying overall, have we got enough renewable energy to make our buildings net zero? And those buildings that we do build need to be as efficient as possible, as efficiently formed and as efficient in the, the fabric as we can possibly make them. So almost there, the scale of the challenge. So um, I've talked a little bit about Passive House. This um, slide just shows you a, a comparison between Passive House and some other standards. On the left-hand side is where we are now with the building regs, uh, building and uh, gas boiler. 20% uh, with an air so improvement with an air source heat pump. That was what was proposed in the recent Partel consultation. London plan, passive house energy building, maybe the future home standard, and then passive house classic. So energy use intensity on the left-hand side, demand. So this, how much does a building use? Um, where do we need to get to? Well, let's have a quick look. So if we made all our passive house, all our buildings passive house, then that demand is at around 45 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. But can we do that? Do we have an infinite amount, an infinite pot of renewable energy? Well, we can look ahead to the future um, at what the National Grid is predicting for 2030, and you can see that we haven't got enough. And you can see also that in 2050, we still haven't got enough. So what does that mean? So that means in plain English, that if every single home in the country was passive house, not just our new homes, but our existing homes as well, on current projections, we would not have enough renewable energy either by 2030 or 2050 to get to net zero. So suddenly net zero starts to look a little bit more difficult. And the men makes, it gives me a wry smile when I hear about cities, local authorities declaring they're gonna be net zero by 2030, 2040, without any idea that actually on the current projections, it's impossible. They're not gonna get there without some serious work and changing the fundamentals. And of course, as I mentioned, the real problem is our existing buildings, um, 26, 29 um, buildings growing in 2030. Every single one of those will have to be retrofitted because they're not efficient enough. Even the buildings we're building now that aren't passive house will have to be retrofitted because they're not gonna be able to get to net zero. So, and if we do the retrofit, Starting on the 1st of January 2020, we need to complete one retrofit every 35 seconds. We don't do them all after the other, so that's a silly target. So let's say each one takes six months. That means we have to have half a million retrofits running simultaneously between now and 2050. And if each one of them needs four people, we need two million people in the retrofit industry between now and 2050 constantly. And currently we've got 135,000. So Greta's not very pleased with us because it's not looking good. So my last couple of slides really are just to talk about how we might be able to achieve this. So the first thing, new build. New build is really quite simple. Every home that we build that's not to a, a high passive house, or very close to passive house, or even better than passive house, is adding to the problem. So let's not do that. And legislation can be clear, part L, and who pays also is clear. The developer pays and the land value then gets pushed out. Um, Renewables, we should have on site if we can, but we should not be mandating net zero on site because that's gonna make us build inefficient buildings. The more difficult problem is retrofit, and there we need to look at what the constraints are, what we can achieve in different types of building, different forms, um, heritage buildings, uh, conservation areas, solid walls. We need to look in detail, no one has done that yet, and we need to work out how that's achievable and what we can do. And what that will do is give us a, um, a, a sort of a budget for how much renewables we need. And we're gonna need a lot more than we currently plan. So finally, um, if you could ask questions, I'm sure you'd have said, what about all these things? Hydrogen, more efficient renewables, more efficient heat pumps, um, high temperature heat pumps, maybe green gas. Um, yes, people are looking at these. People have been looking at a lot of the heat, these for a long time. Hydrogen may be a false dawn. 
um, it uh, will be at least 10 years away. It's got a third of the calorific value of natural gas um, and it's got lots of other issues. And by the way, where does it come from? You either split um, natural gas and sequestrate carbon at scale, haven't worked that out yet, or you use mass scale hydrolysis to produce it. That takes what? Renewable energy. So why don't we use that in the first place? So um, none of those anytime soon. And we actually haven't got any time left because I'm sure you'll all be familiar with the IPCC graph. And what this does is it does not carry on for another 10 years while we work out what to do with hydrogen or the rest of it. It comes down straight away. Um, and that's what we need to be starting doing now. And a more efficient fabric um, is something that we know how to build. Um, and that's been proved by the schemes you've, you've heard this evening. And we can start doing that right now. Thank you very much. John, do you want to stop sharing screen, perhaps? And, uh, uh, there you go. David, are you taking over the last bit? Oh, you're, on, you're muted. De Hello, can you hear me, everyone? Yeah, that's, that's right. Great. Can you see my screen? No, we can just see you at the moment. Oh, that's unfortunate. You have to go. Perfect. Yeah? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, where are we going? Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, there we go. There we go. That's me. Can you see it? Yeah, perfect. Great. Um, thanks, John. Where are we now then? Um, well, last year was momentous for us, obviously, um, for lots of good reasons. But one of the big takeaways from the year was for architects was the climate and bi biodiversity emergency declaration. Um, and even the RIBA started launching initiatives about how architects need to start thinking about whole life carbon assessment. So some very good news there from our industry in terms of aspiration. Um, but it obviously made us think long and hard about Goldsmith Street because this all happened at pretty much the same time in 2019. Um, Greta happened um, and we needed to understand just how good Goldsmith Street was or not. We've been lucky enough to be working with Tim Martell, who is a technologist who's been looking at the embodied carbon at Goldsmith Street, um, as well as the lifetime emissions. So the good news is that Goldsmith Street uh, compares very favorably in terms of its, um, its performance over the next 30 years. The blue is the typical building regs building with um, the kind of typical performance gap you'd get in the UK building industry, and the um, sorry, the red is, and the blue is Goldsmith Street. And Goldsmith Street, up until 2050, will be emitting about a third of the CO2 that a typical UK current building, regs compliant building, would do. Quite good news. Um, but Tim also looked at the embodied carbon. And to be absolutely honest with you, when we designed Goldsmith Street, it was 11 years ago. And we were very focused then on the, on the difficulty of building a kind of streetscape that needed to be robust without using brick. So we felt obliged to use brick, both for the kind of robustness of it and also the, uh, the appropriateness of it to the locality. So when Tim looked at the embodied carbon, we were um, not hugely surprised to find out that it performs quite well because it's timber frame and there's a lot of cellulose insulation in it, but it's not amazing. Um, so it seems to be registering about just over 300 kilograms per square meter of um, internal floor area, which is, just about on the RIBA's target for the year 2030. 
So if you look at this graph, you'll see um, the red line horizontally is our embodied carbon in Goldsmith Street, just over 300 kilograms per square meter. Um, and you know, by 2030, the RIBA is saying that for us to meet our targets, we really should be achieving better than that. And that's the cradle to grave uh, target. If you just look at building materials, it's the dotted red line, which is just over 100 kilograms per square meter. So there's a lot going on above and beyond the specification of materials that architects don't have that much control over. Um, which I think is interesting too. So the gap between the dotted red line and the hard red line is kind of a dubious, you know, control. It's things like, you know, the huge amount of energy released into the, sorry, the huge amount of CO2 released when you um, imagine the end of life cycle of a building. Um, for instance, timber being incinerated. But um, we are, so we're learning from Goldsmith Street as we learn from clay fields. And there are lots of great takeaways from Goldsmith Street, but we're also being given the opportunity by some great clients around the country, um, one of which I want to talk about tonight, which is the city of York, to really take some of the successes of Goldsmith Street and clay field and to build on them. The city of York um, issued a tender uh, about a year ago now for um, an amazingly ambitious program of house building, which really caught our eye because the tender documentation was so unusual. Um, instead of talking about um, our, you know, our, our, our KPIs and our, um, our methodologies, it actually asked us to talk about our aspirations for a low carbon future. And we really, really wanted to win this. And, you know, I'm very delighted to say that we did. Um, so the tender asked us to look at a particular site um, and I'll be showing some of the ideas for that. But this is a framework of um, 450, approximately 450 new homes, which um, York City want to bring forward. Um, and as the executive member for housing, Denise Craghill has said, this is a quote from her this week, um, they want to take it further. They want um, 450 beautiful passive house homes that also promote sustainable transport, good use of green space and a sense of community. And each de de development will generate at least as much energy as each home requires. I think John's talk today has explained why maybe that, that, that might not be achievable, but we'll be aiming for it. But interestingly, they, as a local authority, have asked for us to consider so many um, issues around making a great place to live. Um, so building healthy homes and neighborhoods, um, distinctive, beautiful places, also thinking about sustainable transport and low car use, optimizing bicycle use, thinking about intergenerational living, um, thinking also about how we can help people lead more easily sustainable lifestyles. And as we began to look at, this is a very dry graph, Apologies, but um, as we began to look at the um, sites around York, we needed to know whether the moves we'd made in Goldsmith Street had been the kind of moves that we would want to duplicate elsewhere. So we asked Warm, our um, passive house experts on Goldsmith Street, who were also working within Nor in uh, York to look at some kind of hypothetical scenarios. Um, and one of them is um, terraces, the other one is orientation, and the other one is degree of overshadowing. This is fascinating for me because it talks about um, the heat demand on buildings which face south versus the degree of risk of overheating. Um, and 
I won't I won't drill down to the figures too much, but what it really led us to understand was that terraces of housing are um, really, really good if you're looking to try and provide passive house on a budget. So if you look at this graph, um, it tends to be that a, a, a terrace of four houses to five to six is incredibly good compared to a single house. Not that surprising in terms of form factor, um, but um, overshadowing from a neighbor to the south becomes increasingly important. And this is really interesting, that the overheating risk for buildings facing windows east and west is so much higher in the summer than buildings facing south and north, which sounds almost uh, counterintuitive, doesn't it? And I think it's to do with the fact that it's much easier to protect overheating on windows which are facing south than it is from an east or a westerly orientation. So in essence, what it leads us to think is that schemes that are terraced, that face predominantly north and south with their glazing, are going to stand a much better chance of achieving passive house on the kind of budgets that we're going to need to achieve them with. Which is pretty much what we did instinctively at uh, Goldsmith Street, of course. So I'm going to just um, walk you through the three projects we're working on at, at York. Um, I'm just aware of time. Um, we've got about five minutes, so it's going to be a bit of a trot. So this is the first one, Ordnance Lane, which is quite close to the centre of York. It features a number of existing buildings on the site, um, but it's in a neighbourhood which is very walkable and very cyclable. And our approach is a series of um, north and south facing terraces with ginnels that you might be familiar with from our work at, at Norwich. In this particular case, we're looking at wider um, gaps, wider separation between terraces. So we're talking about 20 meter separation of back gardens, which leads to more productive and um, more generous shared gardens at the back, private gardens, shared only by that particular community of two terraces. And again, a, a street-based scheme which is very focused around the opportunities for shared growing and the, this image shows a, a repurposing of an existing building as a, cafe, a communal cafe. And this is a view of the shared ginnel space, which in this case is more generous, allowing for more than Norwich, um, more than Norwich did with its 14 metres, in this case, 20 metres, which means there's an opportunity for more expansive communal space. Duncan Barracks, another site in York, in this case, right next to York City Football Ground, which is being developed by Per Simon simultaneously as the city of York is developing this site. The neighbourhood is, you know, typical UK suburbia in a way, um, although it's cheek by jowl with some really lovely parts of York again. And our development principles broadly are about kind of optimising opportunities on site. So there's a lovely church gable, which we're trying to expose for the first time and to make a new place um, in front of for use by um, churchgoers and weddings as much as by the um, as much as by our residents so obviously it's about trying to give back to the wider community as well as um, <clears throat> optimizing the opportunities on site for the residents themselves and here's a kind of sketch an early sketch of what that might look like so again it's um its orientation isn't shown here but I'm kind of due south and, and you're looking north. So typically terraces are facing southwest or southeast in this case. So not perfect for passive house. Um, but you know, often we're looking at scales of site such as this, which don't lend themselves to direct southerly, northerly orientation. And, and that's the challenge of trying to work with a, 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 a site which has kind of geometric limitations. 
in this case, we're looking to make a kind of uh, a, a car free central shared play space, which takes its cue from the arms house, which is um, just over the road. I know, just aware of time. Thank you, Emily. Um, and here's a sketch, an early sketch showing how we've revealed the gable of the church and how a ground floor commercial unit is going to spill out onto that new space whilst providing passive house, potentially zero carbon homes above. And a view of the, um, the, the kind of shared garden so that you're looking down a pedestrian and cycle friendly route there back to the main road. And, you know, we're thinking of brick and tile, but we're also thinking of render and we're thinking of timber frame. And we're increasingly conscious, as I've talked about, of the body carbon um, credentials of brick and how we can kind of take things further with more use of render. And finally, Burnham, which is um, further out of town, it's an opportunity to head to, to, to look at a more southerly facing set of terraces, very similar principles to Goldsmith Street, but now we've got the added complexity of trying to go for zero carbon or near to it. And that means this diagram sums it up nicely. Whereas we were always trying to model roofscapes to avoid overshadowing, now we're also having to deal with the provision of PVs on the roof, which of course means overshadowing your neighbors. So there's a tension there. And uh, these are drawings which look at trying to resolve some of those tensions. It's a sketch done by Amir in our office, which um, sums up the, the combination of some of the principles of Goldsmith Street with the kind of PVs on the roofs and the bigger public spaces we've been able to provide here. Luckily here, we've got two local schools which make, make it perfect for um, a place which can really engage with children's play, which is um, something that's very dear to us. And a section through Goldsmith Street on the left um, and the kind of amended section on the right for Burnham, which provides roofscape for more PVs. And I think how we're achieving close to zero carbon is, as John suggested, with, with air source heat pumps in com combination with PVs on the roof, in combination with a passive house fabric. All of which has its complexities and difficulties, but um, I'm just going to wrap up now just by trawling through the last few images of Burnham. Thank you very much. That's us done, I think. Thank you so much, guys. Um, we have, uh, it was absolutely fantastic and hugely useful. And uh, um, I mean, looking at the, the work you showed at the end, I thought was just fantastically exciting. This sense of, it's a bit like thinking of, you know, someone like Neve Brown, the way, the way that he made a series of projects which were ultimately each a refinement of the last and you know added up to a sort of collective project that they were that there was a language being refined over the source of these increasingly large schemes and, and it was so clear the, the 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 lineage of thinking from the projects you've done before um if we don't have any questions because it is a bit late i'm going to wrap up but i know annalee you're coming back to talk to us again aren't you Yes, <laughs> that's something very different. Fellow City um, are um, the, the winning competition win for the um, National Infrastructure Commission about where to put the homes for Oxford and Cambridge, which was an idea about based around um, active track. Oh. Anyways, just just tune in. It's too complicated. <laughs> but I think I think what's been in the press this week is that um, Blenheim have appointed us to to rethink their um, that their estate and provide a new network that will allow them to develop it sustainably. So, as in this instance, being Velocity. Yes, yeah, we yeah. call it Velo City. Oh, Velo City. I do apologise. Um, but um, you know, Velocity works. <laughs> um, okay, I think you're in you're in, you're in about a month's time. Um, so there has been one question I've just seen popped in. Uh, have you found it more straightforward working in urban slash town centre, urban or urban 
Right. Yeah, have you found it more for straightforward working in town centre or fringe locations? Oh, good question. So it's it's more difficult when you're out of town because car use is so much more important to people. And that brings a whole different dynamic to the kind of morphology of a, how you approach a master plan. Um, so Norwich was the kind of sweet spot, 10 minutes walk away from the town centre meant that we were able to make an argument for 0.7 cars per dwelling. Um, whereas in some of our projects, I'm thinking of one in particular at the moment, we're looking at nearly two cars per home. And, and that's a very different equation. It, it makes for a very different place. And so I would say to do the kind of architecture we want to, to, to see coming forward, um, there's almost a sweet spot, which is, um, you know, not, not too car reliant. I think, I think that passive house can only be a component of the things you think about when you, or, you know, is, is it fundamentally a sustainable place to develop? Is, is something that I think is a real problem at the moment. Most new developments are not anywhere near a public transport um, system or walkable neighborhood, completely reliant on cars, ultimately unsustainable. So, you know, cities are in a, in a weird way, more, more sustainable place to develop at, at the present time. Um, but yeah, that's, we talk about that in the next one. <laughs> and just one last question from Steve Porter. Wondering how you can disseminate your gained knowledge to other architects. Good question. Any ideas, Steve? <laughs> That's kind of why we're doing this in a way. I mean, I, um, it, would it be useful if we were to do a kind of um, some kind of uh, user manual? I was wondering if we should do a user manual of what we learned in Passive House because we did have to redesign a lot of stuff. You know, you know, only having one saw pipe in, we, we got flats and we had to, only one saw vent pipe because it's a big coal bridge was, like we had to redesign every single house to, to achieve that. So it wasn't, achieving Passive House wasn't easy. And now we know that we automatically design around that knowledge, but it, it was a lot of work for us. So honest about it. It was a lot of work and, you know, um, it made us, as architects or any designer, you're always trying to grapple with the parameters that you can work with to do something which is memorable and beautiful. And in, in doing work which is low energy, we've had to jettison a lot of our preconceptions about, about what is beautiful. And I think we all need to kind of do that. We, we, I think we need to reinvent, you know, what we're happy to work with because the crisis we're in is, is more important than architects delight at a beautiful concrete yeah. surface. I, I think that's why I chose to show Park Hill because actually I, I, th I think this is actually quite exciting. You know, we're designing around the environment we're in we look back and there are things which, whilst there are problems with them, could could be turned in. I, I think we need to get over the, our, our, our concern about the aesthetics of it and actually work out what the benefits of it are. Because we can't be modernists anymore if we're going to hit these targets. We have to think differently. And that's, that, you know, that could be great. It's exciting. It's, it's a challenge when it's an exciting one. Um, but to come back to the question, Steve, yeah, um, get in touch with us if you have any ideas about <laughs> the best way of doing that.